everyone and welcome to small talk with the etsy collective i'm sunanda and i'm the pr and marketing lead for etsy in india this is an initiative by etsy to bring you closer to the change makers and thought leaders of our times and listen to their ideas for that dose of inspiration that is so required these days our guest for today is the multifaceted mr rajiv sethi and what makes this gathering even more special is the fact that it's his 71st birthday today So, on behalf of everyone at Etsy and the audience, wishing you a very happy birthday, Rajiv Ji. Many, many happy returns of the day. Our moderator for the session is Miss Supriya Dravid. She is the editor of L India. Under her directive, the magazine has become more inclusive and diverse in its focus and coverage. L India is the only magazine to have featured global icons like Oprah Winfrey. Um, so, welcome, Supriya. Now I would like to request Himanshu Vardhan, who is the managing director for HC in India and who is the driving force behind this initiative, to start the session by saying a few words. Great, thanks, thanks, Ananda. Thank you very much. Uh, today is a big day for for us at HC India because we have Rajiv Ji with us today, uh, speaking exclusively. Uh, so in last couple of months, uh, uh, with this obviously unfortunate situation of pandemic taking over, there have been a lot of online and digital sessions going on. Um, we have been able to cur- curate and get some very uh, interesting people. uh on the platform today we have uh, a big star uh, a personal inspiration for me a personal um, sort of an ideal to me i i am really inspired by his work and uh, it's it's a big day because it's also his birthday so very very happy birthday rajiv ji um so i i actually connected with rajiv ji a couple of years back uh, and since then we have met few times um, in different uh, you know at her at a studio that was uh, uh, or at the museum that was there earlier in south extension and now uh, and a couple of times uh, at his new uh, museum uh, in meheroli uh, you saw some of those pictures it's a beautiful space there are there are very few spaces like that uh, in in delhi so whenever any of you get an opportunity uh, you should um, you should visit it um uh, so it's really a privilege to be um, uh, to to have rajiv ji uh, with us um and uh, i'm really really looking forward to it so i'll hand it over to supriya who will uh, who will give a, a proper in- introduction to rajiv ji and be there uh throughout the session and looking forward to hearing from both uh, rajiv ji and anjaya thank you himanshu so who is rajiv sethi the new york times critic john russell called him india's answer to the aglin so is rajiv sethi simply an impresario or a man of renaissance pupul jaykar wrote what a master conductor is to an orchestra rajiv is to design his work has transformed the design vocabulary of india so can rajiv be called a transdisciplinary artist or summed up as an activist who has used creative media to reach out like few of his generation is rajiv a scholar curator thinker or a formidable encyclopedia of cultural insights this is how the princeton architect william larish has summed up Mr Sethi has accomplished so much in so many fields that the gods no doubt will excuse him in his next incarnation from doing anything at all Ezra Pound at the end of his life is reported to have looked back over more than 60 years spent working on his cantos and lamented it does not cohere whatever rajiv chooses to regret at the end of his life lack of coherence to his work will not be among them rather he is someone who has moved effortlessly from one discipline to another within a vision which is transcendently coherent aesthetically socially and spiritually rajiv's ability to implement better than anyone else of his generation sezan's wise directive to advance the entire canvas simultaneously is enviable william larish wrote this over 30 years ago known the world over for his pioneering repertory of mixed media creations over five decades through his work in design and architecture performances and festivals exhibitions and publications policy and program 
He has identified ways to bring contemporary relevance to traditional skills of vulnerable artisan communities. His innovative positioning and proactive interventions with creative stakeholders has been instrumental. It has enabled his Asian Heritage Foundation to create a basis for the maintenance of time-honored legacy industries in an era of industrial mass production and globalization. But for now, we are meeting to explore what made Raji the legend he has become, showcasing only a fraction of his amazing life in the arts. Today, on his 71st birthday, let's welcome him to the session of Small Talk. Of course, Raji would have nothing to do with that title, so he has called his intervention Small is Bountiful. First, let's take a peek into Rajiv's family background, the formative years that shaped his values. Rajiv was born in a family where giving and sharing was the norm. Born to parents of deep persuasion, Rajiv's father, late Kishori Lal Sethi, was a freedom fighter, and his mother, Krishna Malhotra was India's first woman attorney to be accredited by the Supreme Court. Here, you see them with Mahatma Gandhi, who stayed with them at their home in Kashmir. Studying in Delhi's modern school and later at St. Stephen's College, he grew up in a house with his four older sisters. Discrimination between the haves and the have-nots, high and low, between religious beliefs or gender was frowned upon. His theatrical and outgoing personality always made him a star, winning awards year after year across creative genres, painting, creating events, acting, singing, and dancing. Now, we will show you a very photograph of a that has never been seen for 52 years. Rajiv designed India's first discotheque called Cellar in Connaught Place in Delhi, and he did this painting on its wall like many others at the age of 18. A year later, he created another discotheque and called it Asylum. This was also in Delhi in Greater Kailash, where he created a spectacular sculpture as an interior design. Again, he himself painted all over the walls, behind glass and on furniture, even turning sanitary pots upside down to make seats. The third photograph of a model was found only yesterday. It was for a fun palace-like amphitheater, designed as a proposal for the Ashoka Hotel in New Delhi. These projects were visited by the likes of Kupul Jayakar, Charles Korea, and Ramesh Thapar, who became great supporters. Now let's talk about his iconic projects and awards. Of course, Rajiv went on to train with the iconic designer Pierre Cardin in Paris from 1969 to 71. Many internationally acclaimed architectural scenographies and design programs and projects kept him spinning around the world. His seminal contribution to the festivals of India in the UK, USA and France in the 1980s transformed the cultural image of India. The German government's theme pavilion for the Expo 2000 in Hanover in Germany on basic needs and the Silk Road Festival at the Smithsonian in the US in 2002, and his work as a principal scenographer to Universal Forum of Culture in Barcelona in 2004, have all received international acclaim. The Mumbai Airport, the Adani House, the Hyatt Hotels in Chennai and Mumbai, and many, many more unique public art programs have set benchmarks. He may show you a few more during his storytelling. Among, many, among Raji's many citations and awards includes, in 1985, he was awarded the Padma Bhushan. In 2000, the Order of Merit by the Federal Republic of Germany. In 2010, he received the Intact's first Indira Gandhi Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2013, he won the Architectural Digest and Mercedes-Benz Award of Excellence. And in 2017, the government of France awarded him the Chevalier de Lord Desart Elect. So, who is Rajiv Sethi? And what started your journey? Happy birthday and welcome. Hello, everyone. My personal journey, I think, is of really no consequence in these days. 
when there are so many difficult journeys we see each day that uh, are, I hope, not an indication of the future of India. Uh, but if I was to speak about myself, the minuscule journey, I think it started, I think it began with these hands. Very early in life, I found I could do things with my fingers that others couldn't. Um, we used to go to a place in my house in Panchkuya Road called Puli Bhatiari and collect chickney matti. It was probably a flood plain many, many years ago. Great chickney matti. And we used to, I used to create toys to create a landscape and floors by tearing layers of posters and sticking 3D objects. In fact, hands were an introduction to dance too. I understood it through mudra, whether it be the opening up of a flower, the humming of the bee, or the opening and closing of the eye. Uh, this was all the hand was the key to much. And of course, later on, we learned that the millions of neurons connecting the hand to the head took us from being primates to who we are as homo sapiens. We are the only ones who can do this. Nobody has this kind of universal joint. So when we end up just poking buttons, where would we evolve? What would we go to? Uh, so this hand had a great significance in any, in any learning curve that I associate with my education. And I learned that I could do more things with fingers than most. And that sort of uh, put me aside, which I didn't mind. And I, it was risky, but it was pleasurable. And I, uh, whether it was Jeremash to me or Diwali, I would make toys from the chickpea matti that I would go collect myself. I think that uh, uh, hand certainly meant that uh, whatever became a part of my consciousness, if, they, if it got ignited, uh, then I just learned to surrender to it. And I don't do any project or program unless it links me with the stakeholders who have achieved huge competencies with this instrument. So, as I said on birthdays, it's embarrassing. I haven't celebrated Man for many decades, but as is customary and proper, no birthdays can begin with, without proper pranams to my gurus. And I wanted to tell you about Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, who really taught me the essence of what it means to empathize with the artist and support the cultural continuity of an independent South Asia that I will talk about. That curly haired guy in front is me actually. But there are some strange videos we found with long interviews of the lady that in another platform we will see uh, soon if Asian Heritage Foundation can put it together. There's Pupul Jaikar, who I met before I met Kamla Devi a powerful combination of great economic sensibilities, she good you to the core, and, and an unerring eye who taught me how to balance culture with commerce and when to say no. I was very critical, Neti, Neti, not this. I took this creative journey with some formidable mentors who I greatly admire, like Gira Sanabhai with her resilient aesthetic restraint. To those of you who haven't been to the Calico Museum, that's a Mecca. Many journeys began there. Uh, to Ila Bhatt, whose very simple demeanor and phenomenal service continues to inspire so many. I aspire 
such that selfless service with a grassroots connection or connectivity should really be the engine of our lives. Uh, how does my generation then inspire young minds? Uh, how do we return the gifts inherited from our cultural continuum communities, our cultural continuity? Uh, maybe I feel I would need nine lives to return what I've got, that each of you will have your own equation. But I also feel that what this, that the stakeholders of this community have really given, the great uh, skilled people, whether it be Ganga Devi or Ganapati Sthapati or Badri Narayan or people who worked with them in the 60s, John Bimbissel, John Bissell, uh, people who worked with me in the 70s, Jeffrey Larish, Richard Curran, Liz Moynihan, and people in the theater like Habib Tandil, Shanta Gandhi, even Al Qazi, uh, Shiradhar, somebody who's living out of all these Prima Srinivasan, like a gateway to South India for me. I mention this because these truly are like, um, it's like a lost generation. I was very fortunate to have a, a link where they accelerated not just the learning curve, but almost everything that I know that I can make myself useful with. But over the years, these cracked up to very simple uh, talismanic lessons that I think would make for an engaging narrative for Etsy's uh, viewers and whoever else comes on the site to see it. I hope it becomes more inclusive and there are more people. I am deeply suspicious of reserved platforms. I think we need to grow. One needs to make it very inclusive in life. And that's really part of growth. Uh, I think that out of these 10, the first one relates to deep connections. The fact that everything connects, as my mentor Charles Eames would have said, he talked about, well, we all have been discussing transdisciplinary discourses since about 40 years. How Vishnu Dharmotra Puran quite states that if you have to be an architect, you have to be a dancer. To be a dancer, you have to be a sculptor, a musician, a mathematician, a poet. All these things get connected. So I think I would like this journey, although it's to do with crafts and artisans, to start with the performing arts. I think what you're looking at is a, a Royston Abel's play that I scenographed with on, on Annie Frank. And then there is the Hidden River, which is at the NCPA, which is with great gurus like Kenuchar and Mahapatra and Amaru Chakyar and we're rubbing shoulders with Tijan Bai. There were 260 uh, performers in a workshop, which we then produced in a devastated mill. Uh, there was Peter Brooks, Mahabharat, which is in, first in Paris and then many other places. There was also my great uh, friend and colleague and mentor, Aryan Mushki and Ellen Sexu, who, and where I produced, uh, well, I directed him, put together a play called Mother, Daughter, Father, Son, on the systems of transmission. Uh, this transmission is very important and I won't go into pedagogy today, but one of the reasons why we are losing much of what we have is because we don't study any of the things that came very easily to us, to my generation. Why it's important for us to see transdisciplinary is because, look for example, a bhopa. Uh, the bhopas who make these parts. I don't know whether you can still see me, but I'm going to get up and try. I am going to go behind. And if you can see me, with this big part out here, it's a big, huge Pavanji kapar. And uh, that was about 150 years old. But about 40 years ago, we redefined it 
completely new because we realized in villages people weren't even didn't know what the freedom struggle meant. So we invented 37 canto songs, repainted the whole thing, and talked about the freedom struggle. I would have liked to show you what happened in the uh, the darbar then and how it changed completely. However, uh, why I'm mentioning this is that while the Bhopal paints and Joshi's paint with them too and separately, they are part of the department of textiles. But when he sings and performs, he becomes part of the department of culture. Uh, likewise, when a mask is being made, it is handicrafts. When it's being danced upon, it is culture. So this kind of silos is not really what uh, culture, how two plus two can be five. And we have to understand the synergies that create the canvas of cultural concern. I also believe that once we do that, we will realize that the art is alive as long as the artist is. So my initial work about 45 years ago on setting up the Bhule Bisse Kalakar Sehkari Simiti, the cooperative, was, uh, was really a design learning. One had to live with them, to be able to work with them, to understand what the daily problems are. And unless it was not internalized, there was not much I could do to create new things. Designers are not just people who have to answer a need which has a form. It has much more, but that's another issue. But about these people, I have to immediately say, they are self-employed. They are daily age learners. And at the moment, the situation is very sad. They're tenacious. They learn how to stand on their feet. They're all removed from their basti by a builder who bulldozes their places and they're living in a transit camp. And the Asian Heritage Foundation started Head, Heart and Healing, a program for COVID relief in these times of great difficulty. And I'm hoping that uh, we are able to go way beyond just the transit camp of uh, Shadipur Depot, and we already have gone to six states in Andhra, in uh, uh, Telangana, in Urissa, in Madhya Pradesh, in Jharkhand, and Bihar. Uh, so I think that this Triple H campaign is, is not just about immediate relief, it's about what are we going to do with threatened livelihoods? So they, are, they were hunger warriors till yesterday, but they're also very dignified. So today it's about livelihood. And I will show you some of the things that uh, address this concern. We then come to the second point. It's the art craft divide. Now this has always made me very nervous and many of my artist friends, principally people like Manu Parekh and Madhavi, but Manu more than anyone who started working many decades ago with the handicrafts and handloom board. There was Nirima and Gulam, there is Param and Arpita. Arpita also worked with the Viva service centers. There's Gita and Gwil of Vivan. And I feel that it is very important that this concept of high low, what is art, what is craft, this is all excess baggage. It's a colonial excess baggage and we should put it aside. Now, I want to show you something that Manjeet Bawa and Chandrakala Devi, a great craftswoman, made. Uh, this has been with me for about 30 years now, but it started a whole dialogue and a paper mache, which was a household skill, skill is now a, a well-known skill that is being used to make things for uh, both local and for urban markets, and some amount of export too. Now, uh, Patuas, for example, this whole village, Nayagao in, in Middapur and in Birbhum, as if the misery of 
the COVID wasn't bad enough. Then came the huge cyclone that happened day before yesterday. Now these artists have been working with me over many, many decades, but now we've been preparing an exhibition on, on relief from, with new lyrics and new paintings that they've made and on Corona. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this subject in, in the issue about what is contemporary and what is traditional, these are, if I see well, these are of a tsunami. Have they already shown the... Before that, you saw 9-11. You saw now, when, when these great artists, I underline, these artists are struck with something, they immediately respond with lyrics. They're capable, they're complete artists. They're capable of making a painting and singing. Complete artists by themselves. Now, when they can improvise and relate to contemporary ideas, why are they considered traditional artisans and somebody like Jamni Roy, who is considered a contemporary artist, who also responds to local stimuli? Now, when we see the Kaligat paintings, what, how do we make these bifurcations? So it's the second point I want to make. And to those young who are watching, I think it's important for you to put aside this total uh, uh, colonial legacy of excess baggage of high and low of art and craft. The third point is bespoke asymmetry. And this I think is very critical. How do we step, stay one step ahead of the machine? Otherwise we are doomed. There is no future for the artisans. The machines can do everything. They can do interlocking, they can do new inlays, they can do jamdanis, the likes which you've never need. So I want to share this with you. I think when you look at, for example, now this is the Banjara embroidery. Uh, can you see this carefully? Uh, look at the absolutely contemporary sense of asymmetry where the eye is informing the finger in a way that life opens up. Now, in our geo merchandising, we have developed a whole cluster, two clusters of Susni ladies who are doing totally asymmetrical embroideries now, this is what emotional retina is about. The emotional retina. One step ahead of the machine. There's no repeat. This is how it can also become bespoke. And I think this will clearly be the future. They are at the moment uh, making Susni masks. My own, which was done by my dear friend Himanshu. Is that you got mine there? Wonderful design uh, with Kora cotton. Uh, and a lovely sleeve inside to make it any amount of layers that you want. And what's lovely is that this, this part goes over your head and this part you can, you can narrow it and tie it the way you want to. And it doesn't, it doesn't suffocate. I'm, I'm very claustrophobic and I could never breathe in anything that wasn't organic or cotton. So I think it's very important that in the immediate danger we made many, many masks which had to be related to contingencies. We couldn't be artistic about it. These were immediate issues. They were relief. But now when if this is going to be the new normal, so we might as well do it with a sense of who we all are. And human beings uh, will always be who they are in spite of what happens. So uh, likewise, when I saw you, Susni, I talk about Baswan Biga. Baswan Biga is this village where they've, well, since my father's time, I remember all the curtains in Rashtrapati Bhavan used to be made in, in this village near Nalanda. But they did no asymmetry. And machines were now making all these in, uh, you know, in Paripat. So uh, to teach them all to become, uh, to 
enjoy their skill as an alphabet to say anything, anything at all, was an experience and something that's liberating and perhaps it commercially makes sense. So my fourth point, uh, I'm not going to the detail to tell you how must be because each of this that I'm talking about in uh, three or four minutes is actually has a lot more information and hopefully we will be able to develop it as separate sessions that they deserve not just with me but with many people speaking about issues that are going to be clearly in the forefront as we battle with this distancing and with new medias now storytelling now here you see behind you and behind me, as a matter of fact, if you see there behind me, there is a big map of, uh, sorry, a, a, a big uh, tree of life. My friend Arun last birth me on this idea of making a, 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 a tree of life in what was influenced by the Silk Route. I did these Silk Routes at the Smithsonian and uh, we, 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 were, we, were, we were very concerned that uh, we should talk about uh, what is happening as a precursor to internet, right from China to Italy, how forms were becoming, uh, were telling us stories, a kind of a history, a narrative that had a lot to do with migrations, with travel, with trade, and these influence what tradition is all about. And traditions are not ever static, they're completely dynamic. So you find the Kalankari workers now in Kalahasti emulating what they made a silk route. You see the silk route becoming an idea that can have markets for wherever people now are referring to as this as a great cultural phenomenon. So we need to look at stories because stories sell and Silk Route of which India was such a critical part must become more manifest in international markets. Why this is a story? I'm reminded by my very good routine here. When I was about 16, I would travel around Persia and pick up these, you know, these beautiful Kalamkaris. I thought they were always Persian. Till I noticed, and if you can see the one on your screen, which is probably bigger, I saw that the date was written in Telugu. And all the others that I was buying, for some reason, had an empty, an empty piece of the, uh, cloth when nothing was written. So I assume, long before our Prime Minister thought of Made in India, uh, people were making things in Kalahasti, in, uh, sorry, in Masali Patnam, and sending them all the way to Persia to be signed by a Persian Ustad and sold as Persian. So this kind of cross-fertilization has stories, which we should then again learn, regurgitate, think and replan and represent to a market waiting to hear them. Uh, so uh, then we go, uh, we then go to uh, living traditions, as I said, which are always dynamic. Now, what is rolling behind me, as you can see, is uh, the work that Swaminathan first did, going into the village of the Perhans of Kond tribals. This is Dangar's original work. Now, Jankar was quite ingenious, and he understood Swaminathan's uh, contemporary eye, because Swaminathan himself had great tradition behind him. So I think when, when, they, when they start that dialogue, a whole new school gets started, which is the cones. Now, you see this, uh, uh, this part that I have here, which is like this, but you can show it on the screen. You're showing it? It moves all over. <coughs> now, these are books. We are looking at hand-painted books for the last 20 years. This was done about 
a thing like this was done about, if I recall, about 50, 45 years ago. My colleagues, Rita Kapoor Ananba Sanyal in Balbhavan, something that we've been working on also for a long time over the last decades. Now, this pirate tradition also, Gulam Sheikh has made some wonderful ones. Uh, so, uh, likewise, uh, the same cones today are making these pottery. They are, they are, this is all glazed. So these patterns are more minimal, but, uh, but they're all glazed. You can eat from them. And these are being sold at the geo store, which you must access. Um, uh, now, after the cone, I wanted to show you some Madhubani uh, wallpapers. Now, how many, you know, how many paintings can we keep buying? They don't enough walls to be able to put them. So uh, we started, I developed this whole thing called Madhubani wallpapers, and you can connect them. They all connect up with each other. Sorry, you're sorry. <laughs> they all connect one of the others. And there's a tiger theme. There is a people theme. There is a tree of life theme. Many, many boxes. Okay. So now, uh, wallpaper tiles is because a craftsman home cannot make huge sheets of wallpaper. They're not big enough. And we don't know where they're going. So you may have a small wall or you may have a large wall. So if you can module it, you can make a module. And I thought the module should be such that can connect in all four sides, like we do in textile design. And you could make it very large and yet not one piece could be like the other, or you could make it small the way you want it to be. So that was the idea of the uh, modular Madhubani wallpaper. Now we made it in various styles. Then leather puppetry. Now, the Tona Bomalata, the, the leather puppets of Andhra, for example, have a great uh, promise. Uh, from uh, India, it's gone all over, but I don't even think you can see. I bought them in China. I bought them in, I bought them in, uh, in uh, Indonesia. But I have a collection of about uh, how many? Two, six thousand of them, which need to be properly accessed by designers who want to who want to be able to to use this to create new ideas obviously something to do with puppetry and something to do with storytelling but also a great skill how they puncture that goat skin level and how they create uh, diaphanous lights so these lights that Joe is now making is one on top of my door as well which you can see, I don't know, you can, but they can see like that. So, so lights. Now I go to this. So these are, uh, uh, so what we have now is we are now to the, actually to the, to the sixth point. And I want to talk about the same skill as an extremely inventive alphabet, not necessarily linked to the cultural context. Now, this is a, a debatable issue. People get very angry when you talk about skill as an alphabet that the world can use because they say alien ideas come in, they use our language, they change it, but it's been happening for centuries. And I think if you can conduct the dialogue with a sense of dignity for those who have nurtured it most, the craftspeople, the anonymous genius, and expose a a fertile imagination of contemporary designers to this, they can only be a win-win situation uh, because it's a dialogue. It's not just India as a labor market, but India as a place reinventing itself, working with the best in design from all over the world and being confident enough to stand on its own feet and say, we'll take it on. Now, there was a, a huge exhibition that I curated and put together called the Golden Eye in the last century in 1985 at the National Museum of Design in New York, uh, Cooper Hewitt. Uh, uh, this is Ettore de Sotsas, who worked with, there were many people who came, prior to Mario Bellini, there was Mary McFadden, there was 
Sandra Rhodes, there was Andrew Logan, there was Charles Moore, there was Milton Glaser, there was Ivan Shemaev. And uh, they all came and went into villages with me to create a range of new ideas that could have a market way beyond what these skills were used to. Hans uh, But unfortunately, like most things that were in that century, everything was dependent on bureaucracy and a very hand handed bureaucracy that didn't understand, couldn't link markets with villages in the way that we can do now. And this whole exhibition was never shown in India, even to the stakeholders, and then kept so carelessly that it all got burnt in a fire and went out of existence. I just have a few photographs, but it's quite possible to go back and do this all again. This is what the young must do. Must remember that these are these skills are the inheritance of humankind, not just of India. They can excite the imagination of people anywhere in the world. And we should welcome that with a sense of confidence. It will help even designers, because I remember the young people who worked at GoldenEye then, and there were several, who are now independent designers, who I don't think as working as apprentices that I put them to with, with international designers, because they had access to their studios. And it was a nascent field. And when they were working with these people, they were able to learn much faster. And now they have their own footprints internationally. And that's how India must feel confident and absolutely uh, ready to take on the world. Uh, uh, so I think, likewise, we let's talk about Dambu. Uh, my friend Jalant Mahadev, great architect, quality of inquiry of Jigyasa, Jigyasu hai. Wo hamere saath chala gaya Jharkhand mein. Ab jahan pe wo log baas ki ye ye machli pakarne ke liye ye banate hain. Ab isme jab machli chale jaye to bahar nahi nikal sakte. Matlab ye log sirf do mahine ke liye kaam karte hain. Jab barish aati hai aur rice fields are flooded and they can catch fish. But what do they do for the rest of the year? So we started to work on furniture, on screens, on lights on many things and that they were in a new market if i'm not mistaken those lights were taken for a big chinese restaurant lately a huge order came. then look look at siki i i know that mm -hmm. I because these are my favorite i did many installations based on these if you can see me this is done by the siki crafts people and uh, there are many i mean i i think i put one on on Mrs. Uh, Smithy Rani, didn't I? Did you have a picture of us? Where is that? I don't need to be put it in. But anyway, you should show it. should never look so good. So, um, so I think this, uh, Siki is, we made screens, we have made many things now, furniture. They were for ritual containers during marriage that they were used. But there's, and there are many, many, many such stories. But I'm cutting it short for my seventh point now, which is the anonymous genius. I think it's important that we have a sense of humor. And uh, again, I'm sorry, everything goes back many decades, but I found this bottle, no, I didn't find the bottle, the craftsman gave it to me in a Haryana village. You can't see it, but it's a whiskey bottle. And very carefully, Mark is very wicked sense of humor. He has been able to make a bottle and sitting and spilling his fine khadi, all done in many, many pieces. But how dexterously his fingers have worked in creating a bapu on a charka in a whiskey bottle. Now, you know, I don't want to, uh, it's a sense of humor, must be able to laugh at things too. Uh, and I'm sure Bapu would have loved to, although he would have disagreed about the recipe. But I must say that the, these other women came up and lots of them were started to make, men and women, these useless men who sit in their cart making out guys, were the ones who then really started to work on making these gods and goddesses in bottles. Okay, so things like these whimsy the bottles, uh, 
uh, there is the fantasy amphora box baked by an old man in a biscuit tin with hot ash. Now, there is no such craft. It doesn't exist. But innovation is also part of the name of craftsmanship. And, of course, here, if I didn't mention nature, great nature, my very dear friend, who I've had the privilege of knowing when he actually started as a, as a storekeeper who was breaking rules in a, in a small little store in the forest near Chandigarh, and that grew into the rock garden. Uh, this outside art, what called outside art, is truly uh, what future is also about. Uh, then I come to link to this, but much more, much more than people who get known in the outside art, about the anonymous genius. Look for them. This is really, truly a point that I, I keep raising to all the people who talk about mapping. We talk about mapping the craft as if it ends with Baba Kharat Singh Mahal or with our hearts, wherever they be, or with the few that we happen to take to our melas. A very important component. And that must continue to be the flagship for all what we've been doing, what we've called artist candles and handicraft. But remember, millions have never been classified because the classification of what I called the design without designers, these people who are the rural artisans, whether they be Khatis or Lohars or Kumars or Barais or Charamtars, look at this amazing jaru. I've shown it on the net earlier. And look at this, it's made by the people in Jharkhand. It's just a, a grass that has been, that has been made into a, a very ergonomic, beautifully designed handle. And, and this has been with my, I mean, these have been with my family for 20 years, but look how wonderful, what a great design. Even a designer could, and these are anonymous, but they're great geniuses. And there are hundreds of such. You could do books and books of the anonymous genius in this country. Now, uh, there are, I was saying that like the Jharus, there are other uh, issues that I think have never been seen uh, by urban audiences because they're not for urban audiences. They're for rural markets. They're for local produce. It's local produce for local group, which has a whole different market. The hearts have to become their main strength. Then let's go to the ninth point. I'm slowly coming to the end. Which is the bridge between arts and crafts have spoken, but I haven't spoken about arts and crafts and architecture and engineering. Now, I don't know how many of you know, but 2% of all public artworks has to be towards dedicating it to arts and crafts. What you're seeing now is my Bombay airport. What the Reddies were very generous and extremely astute in understanding, GVK uh, and Sanjay, who said, yes, I'm willing to come up with 2% of the budget for the airport and let's invest in arts, which are local. So I think that is what created a, a, a wonderful canvas for 1,500 people that I could work with over five years to produce things that would otherwise not have had public access. So potters who only make votives for like the Molela potters that you see right now that, that are making votives for local people can also stretch their imagination. The Molela potters making aeroplanes landing and going. We have a double grande, which uh, is also manifested in this mural, uh, which I did uh, for that place. Then, so likewise, now I come to my, the idea on, on architecture and engineering. Uh, so this infrastructure is going to be the new patron. Uh, and I've done a project which I still have not spoken about to anybody, neither to the people I wish to present it to. But I mean, there is Maharashtra, for example, is planning a big way from Bombay to Nagpur. Now, cutting through this highway, there are thousands of Pagdandis that connect millions of people that have great skills. Now, why should local have to come to cities to become known? 
When we talk about slow travel, slow food, or slow fashion, or slow lifestyle, then travel is going to be this. Who's going to go in a plane with a kind of, I mean, I do go by plane, but God forbid when I said, so what all you have to do, I would much rather uh, go in my car and stop and, and take time. Take time. Nothing wrong. So I think highways and all the uh, different freight corridors have to start thinking differently, linking arts and crafts to infrastructure. So each of these could be zones, cultural zones. So the restaurants, the service stations, the Krishi Kendras, all the services there could be for the local people who, don't, who can just come onto the highway, as indeed they do now. If anyone can travel on road, anyway, you're from going from Ahmedabad to Udaipur, you see travel people bring all the foods onto the main road, showing it up to say, so imagine they had a place where they could sell what they make, they could be the orders, they could host it. How will this be funded? All that's also being planned and worked out. But I think what's required is a different imagination. And we must not let that, these crises take over that part of us. Because unless we think differently, and we have to start inventing new ways of relating with the crafts. Okay, my last point is on all this is only useful if there is an emotional connect. When I turned 70, uh, I, something happened. I think it just snapped. I didn't gravitate to anything that didn't move me. And if it moved me, whether it's art, crafts, it had to move me. I couldn't respond to form alone. Now look at this bailer, I have it here. Look at the way it's worn out over the edges. It's 30 years of a mother making chapatis for her entire family. She's raised it, her family on her love and effort. Now, this Balin has other Western connotations, but not hers. Uh, and remember, this came with her in her diary. It probably looked like this. And to those who don't know how it works, is that you have a Balin and you go like this all the time uh, from your hands. So the edges get worn out. Now, every time I touch this, every time I have it in my hand, uh, I think of Ma. I think of her in, in the most um, intimate uh, ways which art helps us bridge. I think unless it is moving, unless it's about emotion. I really don't think it's about art or craft. Everything has to be more than just tactile or visual. There has to be something else which is emotionally rich. So I think I, I will stop there, but I would like to conclude it, especially for the generation that's coming after us. I thought this would be something that I would be enjoying and fully in the middle. That's what Kamla Devi and all advised me that the next, the next is about South Asia. So I have been for the last 20 years saying, look beyond India, look just at the neighborhood. Uh, so I do believe that uh, we should, I end again with a hand. It's the kind of slogan we developed for Asian journeys, for South Asian journeys. I call it Sesha, just as our Rupaya will be called Sesha everywhere, whether it's Nepal or Bangladesh or Pakistan or Afghanistan or Bhutan or Sri Lanka. These are linked civilizational memories. These are uh, the, the, the commonalities that we cannot afford to alienate because the hate the, the, the machinery of hate, the, the kind of money we put into that could better be used to, uh, to rid poverty and to empower people who are extremely skilled. This is the most skilled part of the whole world. 
and we must not allow it to be de-skilled. So I end my, my interaction with you, with these, again with the mudra, I want you to just experience this. Diversity, connectivity, empowerment, peace. Indeed, if we can stretch our imagination and work to looking at the skill sector in the whole subcontinent, uh, no pandemics will bring us down. And, but before you end, I know my grandchildren have bought me a birthday cake, which is made with foraged food. So we'll have to not uh, click off and run away. But we'll have to go to that. So now, please, uh, with your questions. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you so much, Rajivi. That was very insightful and very inspiring. Uh, Sunanda, before I ask him a question, I wanted to check how we're doing on time. Do you have some audience questions with you? Uh, I'll ask one question and then let me know and then we can plan accordingly. Yes, uh, I think uh, we have time for a few questions. We can start. Okay. Uh, I have one question for you, Rajivji. Uh, in a world that is evolving constantly and with the technological advances that we've had, how do we keep the human connection with art alive? Uh, we have no choice. That's one reason enough. We don't want to become machines. We have to reach out in practical terms. I weigh nothing but hand looms. Start with wearing at least once in every week. Start eating foods that are forage, that don't come out of a, a processing industry. Uh, just next time you're sitting in a taxi or in a rickshaw, ask what that man did. He may well be a weaver. He could be an experienced person. Reach out to him. I can't go into details of how you can reach out. Each of you will find your own individual equation. But constantly be on the alert. That if you're not alert, you will be closer to being a machine that you don't want. Beautiful answer. In your opinion, how do we share... I mean, I know you've done this beautifully through technology, but how do we share traditional art forms through technology without losing the essence of traditionalism? Uh, you have to be very careful. I didn't, there's a whole lecture that I have on real and fakes. Everything that you see today, almost in terms of handloom, remember handloom too, I'm a, a lot of it is yeah. machines, the yarn comes from machines. About 150 years ago. <clears throat> but today, even e cuts are being made in machine. So the concept of warp and weft being a resist has gone. Machines are making them things for their time. Unless you go for the real, fakes will take over. So I'm afraid if you develop their time for the real, there will be a market for those who will not touch the machine. And you need to know where machine comes in to alter the very sensibility of what is made by hand. We have to be very careful in this medium scale and small scale industries baggage that we are getting right now. Most of it is going to be machine made. What you get from Muradabad, 90% is machine. In the back lanes, people are still working with their hands, doing chitai, doing engraving. But what you're selling in export markets as handmade is actually machine made, machine. which will have implications for trade too. So I think it's important to know, look for the real, beware of fakes. And I believe that those are becoming much more ubiquitous. They're becoming everywhere. Much more. I presented an exhibition to the Minister of Textiles at the Asian Heritage Foundation of all the fakes that I bought from the government emporiums, from Khadi and from Cottage Industry. Nobody could guess that they were fakes. Then masters explained to us what they were. But this is a separate session. How to tell a fake from the real. 
why do you think it's important to empower artists it's uh, i think any society is a great peril if it forgets to look at itself it's, this is like a mirror the arts reflect what we want to be and what we don't want to be and if you're not going to help these people who tell you lead you with great sense of humor and wit and wisdom and poignancy and pathos then you will stop looking at yourself and uh, perthari said that uh, uh, that it's a society that is fit to go to go the dogs if it forgets the creative community it's said in different ways in hindi i can't remember the poem uh sunanda uh, do we have any audience questions uh, on the side bar because i'm just trying to see it because i know we've had a very very interactive uh session with all the chat groups going crazy but is there any that you spotted because i'm just going through right now any questions for rajiv ji over here yes in fact uh, i can see one where somebody is asking that rajiv ji how did you find your guru in life that's a great question yeah uh uh you know i explained who my gurus were but maybe uh, uh that was a particular story it has relevance for me um i was really lucky but along with luck uh, there is to be a lot of uh there has to be a lot of planning you have to arrange to meet them and if you're lucky you find them but uh uh they are not <clears throat> they might pass you by if your senses aren't open they may be sitting next to you <laughs> i have uh, sorry can i interrupt i have two questions uh, rolled into one one is how do you keep yourself motivated and the second part of the question is Uh, there's a young girl who's a graphic designer here who says that she's also interested in handmade arts and crafts and she asks how do i commit myself to the art and how do i keep myself motivated from the criticisms of society who think you know working on one particular aspect is everything uh your one question answers the other start working with your hands start working in what you call the real crafts or anything that you want to do which is interpersonal less by careless is this medium you're looking at stop pressing too many buttons press them but only one hour a day get out like we tell our children get out be more tactile once you start doing that believe me it'll be more than motivation you never stop you never stop never stop gunjan here has a question how does one organize gunjan, the craft a dear friend person who work wonderful things in orissa she is asked how do you uh, organize craft clusters across india uh that's some uh, gunjan that's a question you have uh, you are in the thick of it you work in the villages of odisha it's a question that would require another seminar to uh, there is my friend anandi who's here who will tell you about her experiences on how we set up 22 clusters in six states it is uh, a lot of work and it can't be done sitting on your desk if you do not travel and travel at in my age meant uh, foot meant going into water waist deep sometimes as deep as a shoulder bullock carts and bullock carts and bullock carts and tongas and buses and cars and jeeps and jongas planes came very late so it means travel staying with them working with them making them feel that this is what they need it empowers them you have to be just a catalyst it cannot be dependent on you so setting up a a cluster requires nothing more than grass root work and amongst the poorest of the poor empowering them at all point not disempowering them by 
putting too many ifs and buts or chains on them, dependent on them. But this is a long discussion, and one has to go through it separately. There is a question here from Chiranjeev who says, "Do you see new art forms emerging, particularly from the anonymous artist?" Well, I just gave you three. <laughs> if you people were sitting with me for the whole day, I could go on. There is another question here: uh, How can we, as young designers, help artisans of dying crafts? Commit yourself first in your heart. that you're willing to get out of your comfort zone and come to a zone which is profoundly enriching it is demanding first convince yourself that you want to get out of this then there are many people like me hundreds of people like me i can name many many of my colleagues who been working for so many decades is jaya this laila there are ashok chatterjee who's been a master with with the craft councils of india there are many this is i think just a gateway but if you're curious and you want to go even further then you'll have to find your path and you'll have to trod that path and you'll have to make your path and there are many more paths that people have in trod and finally a last question what steps can be taken at an individual level to empower artisans and help crafts find ways into the contemporary design world at the individual level meaning at what level at the, you mean at the level of at a personal level which I individual think. at a personal level i think i think i've already stated that firstly how how does one get committed to the sector for example in my practice i don't do car fairs and i don't do any uh, commission that comes my way some offer a lot of money my hook is is it going to involve my working with a lot of creative people then i say yes so i use that 2% idea are you going to spend as much in arts and crafts involving them so my scenographies my design involve craft people whether it be the interior of a house or a corporate work or a you know a airport or a now i'm very keen on bus stations and railway stations and all highways but i'll only do them if it's not just uh, you know ratified few artists uh, which already have a name and they say great work great the artisans it won't make it won't make my creative juices flow it all other things have relevance so i do not wish to even uh, belittle the creative community ever I am part of that. When I'm alone, I sketch, I paint. I may never show it, and those who do show it too are also complete. But if you want to work with the arts and you want to be able to reach out, then I'm afraid uh, you have to make this part of your work. And personally, go buy these clothes, as I said earlier, or eat that food. Don't buy other things. At least stop. using them more and now with the slow down slow life will become part of your survival and your survival becomes the survival of others and everybody's survival together is the survival of the world so this has come to us at a time when the world was running completely crazy now we don't learn from this we have no future we have no future last two questions how can the mindset this is from tushar who has asked you how can the mindset of people be changed towards handmade art people don't usually value handmade art and the effort behind it and not willing to pay the price it's correct price is yeah. that something to do with machine made products being made available easily available how can the respect be restored yeah well most people who buy it as ethnic bric a brac or little decoration don't even know they're buying machine made so that part i think the question hints to what i did not touch which is pedagogy where well, i just referred to it unless this becomes mainstream curricular in primary school secondary school college as theses great crafts people as doctors as professors there is no future whatever you say it's doomed to fail 
फर्स्ट मशीन मार देगी उसके बाद हमारा अपना इंडिफरेंस बाकी कुछ जो बचा है वो भी मार देगा और वी वोट बी एबल टेल द डिफरेंस सो फर्स्ट एंड फॉरमोस लॉन्ग टर्म आंसर वी मस्ट स्टार्ट डूइंग समथिंग नाउ फॉर माय जनरेशन हम तो गए हम तो खत्म अब जो आ रही है उसको भी कुछ नहीं मिलेगा अगर वो अभी शुरू नहीं हुआ सो वी हैव टू स्टार्ट राइट नाउ विद इवॉल्विंग करिकुलम which is linked to skills we must not de-skill people please don't forget that this is the most vital connection to your brain where are we using it the brain is no longer using this my grandchildren now have come with my cake they, <laughs> I, they keep hearing this all the day long about how the neurons i try to use technical language millions of them are connecting us to our mind and has made us who we are we no longer monkeys why do you want to go back being monkeys again thank you so much ajit ji that was very insightful no, no, we can't say thank you <laughs> no no I, i know i know i know my god children have come i know i know so uh, over to okay. you sananda uh, so thank you thank you so much so my, my little babies come come here you brought them so come here's my son prabhu you tell me something good job here's my little disha Oh, hello, hello. Yadu and Mira, <coughs> who's been doing <coughs> Anandi, Anandi. But how can you show this? Up? Oh, you bought a whole dress. Ah, oh, yes. Oh, wow. My dear friends, Eid Mubarak. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow is Eid. Yeah. So my my children remind me here. You can't see it, but I. We can. Wow. It's it. Yeah, it's yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, there's a dead sicker too. Oh. Hey, my dude. Cheers, Eid ka chaal. Eid Mubarak. Wow. Maybe I shouldn't be doing the three hugs because that social distancing will stay. But Eid Mubarak to all of you. And and the button. Mask. Chill, chill. Chill. Happy birthday, Raj. Happy birthday too. Thank you. Thank you for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, my team has been really working hard and breaking all the rules, which is not a good idea. But what could we do? We have to get used to a technology that. really uh, is all about mug shots and we wanted to move we wanted to do my white and my bath tie the only flowers we could get is all that the only stars are not that nice man thank you thank you now i'm very happy thank you ever much we man sure thank you very much thank you sir i thank really you. Uh, um, you must be closer to Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you to you. Manshu, do you want to say a few yeah, words? To yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rajiv ji, uh, I think clearly, um, and and I, I'm not sure if, and we can send across all the comments. There have been tens and probably hundreds of comments that uh, people have sent across. Obviously, a lot of them wishing you a very happy birthday, but also saying that this is the best session. a lot of people are have been saying that this is the best session or webinar uh, that they have attended during during you know since this thing all all of the lockdown happened in Was fact a lot of <laughs> no i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> in fact uh, one of the comments was very interesting which was uh, in this in this in this time of gloom when we focus on a lot of things i think this was this was really uplifting uh, the session was very very positive very very uplifting um uh, so really really thank you for that uh, not just i mean for you to to you uh, absolutely but also also to uh, all of your team actually uh, you know uh to the audience actually j- just so that you know um rajiv ji and his team they have been working hard to put together this beautiful presentation for last few days uh it's just incredible amount of um, effort by the team um, as well to pull this off uh obviously like you know uh, uh, ideally we could have uh, if we could have had a situation where the camera could have moved around in the studio 
uh, which hopefully we will put together at some point of time when the lockdown is over and people can move around a little bit more freely uh, we would uh, we would love to do that um to to all of the audience i would also uh, like to especially mention one point um, uh, rajiv ji's asia asia heritage foundation is doing some incredible work with artisans um uh, it, uh, and taking care of them uh, uh, you know uh, when when this thing happened a lot of artisans got impacted financially so the foundation has been working a lot uh, working with these artisans in different parts of india to to help them out in in these times so uh, if uh, people in the audience you know if you want to contribute that's a that's a that's an amazing uh, that's an incredible uh, incredibly effective organization to contribute um another point that i would mention uh, is no overheads that, all money goes directly to the communities no overheads yeah. not even one percent yeah and i can uh, you know i can vouch for that i've seen some of the work we have gotten into some of the conversations and uh, we have heard about we have heard great things about what the foundation is doing uh, a lot of you have also asked that um, you would want to buy these products and uh, uh, so so the uh, asia heritage foundation's brand is called geo uh, you could obviously visit the studio oh, when j i y o yeah <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> clarification <laughs> so uh, you can uh, you can obviously you uh, the, the museum is a hidden hidden treasure you've seen some pictures it's an experience to visit there uh, so i would um, i would um, encourage all of you when things normalize and uh, we are able to move around a little bit freely then to to visit the museum so there's a store in the museum that you can purchase a lot of these pro uh, products uh, also uh, these products are available on geo's website which is g y g i y o dot net dot in if i oh. if i know it correctly <laughs> geo dot j i y o dot net dot in uh, yeah, the mind they've been corrupted <laughs> Ours was before J I O. J O was registered 15 years ago. Oh. <laughs> so um, so with that um, um you know i will um, uh, uh, you know we 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 probably ha had this session as the longest session that we have had till now but uh, it has been interesting and uh, very engrossing all throughout um so really thanks a lot to everybody for being part of this session and especially rajiv ji and the team and with your permission just yeah this sure sanchari is riya this praveen is naresh yes. is anil is abilash can we see them people. can we see them on the camera you can see them but yeah. they were not here yeah. i wouldn't be here can, can we can can they come back can they can they just come behind you okay awesome so there's like masking and <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Lovely on your look. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Just amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.